Hi everyone and welcome to the Emergency Physicians ECG course. This is Hisham Ibrahim, I'm one of the Emergency Medicine Consultants in UK and today we will discuss two cases that we've covered in the Facebook page of the Emergency Physicians ECG course. Those were case number two and case number 28. They've both covered the same condition that I think it's a really interesting one and um, we will try to cover both cases in this video. So let's start with case number 28 because it's got the more interesting ECG and the more educational one in terms of the findings. So this was a case about a 19 year old male patient presented to ED with recurrent episodes of palpitations and presyncopal events. There was no chest pain at all or breathlessness at any point of time. He's had a 12 lead ECG on arrival to ED and here we go. So broad complex, regular tachycardia, the patient was in VT. So clearly a really concerning rhythm. And um, when the patient was seen with this rhythm, he was immediately transferred to the recess room. And on arrival to the recess room, his heart rate has changed. So a repeat ECG was done. And this is what they found. So what I want you to do now is I want you to pause this video have a proper look at this ECG, think about the presentation and try to find what's going on. And uh, I will talk to you in a second. So welcome back. Uh, I hope you've got some sort of a differential diagnosis in your head and probably you've got the, um, the final diagnosis uh, by now. So we're going to analyze this patient from the clinical point of view first. So this is a, an interesting differential diagnosis that I really like um, because it covers a lot of the presentations to ED. Basically, we're going to talk about what should go through your head when you're faced with an ECG for a patient who's coming to you with either presyncope, syncope or palpitations. When you see an ECG with a presentation like this, so I think the differential diagnosis should be three no brainers you shouldn't forget ACS arrhythmias and pulmonary embolism. I don't think any of us will miss the findings um, of any of these three uh, in an ECG for a patient who presents with syncope. Then you've got two intervals to uh, check. You've got the PR interval and the QT interval. For both of them, you need to check for short and long. So long PR interval is part of a trifascicular block and short PR interval is gonna be part of pre-excitation syndrome. And for the QT interval, both um, long and short QT intervals are associated with um, polymorphic VT. Then you'll be left with three congenital problems that you should think about. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, Brugada syndrome, and arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. So this is the differential diagnosis that you sh should think of when you're analyzing an ECG for a patient who's coming to you with syncope. So let's go back to our ECG and analyze it to find, trying to find out which of these conditions was the one. So let's start from here. If you have a look at V1 to V3, the first abnormality you will all notice there is that we've got T wave invergence uh, over there. And if you remember from previous discussions um, on the Facebook page, when we talked about the T wave invergence, we said that we've got two different shapes of T wave invergence. T wave invergence can be asymmetrical like this and they can be symmetrical like this for the asymmetrical one the top ones they're abnormal but they are they can be because of relatively benign conditions they can be associated with strain pattern they can be associated with left ventricular hypertrophy but the symmetrical ones those are the concerning ones those are the ones that you will see associated with PE with ACS with these sorts of serious conditions and if you have a look at our one in here you will notice that it is symmetrical. If we move on um, we will notice in V1 to V3 as well especially in V2 that we've got this. So this weird looking notch at the end of the complex and the beginning of the ST segment this is the second abnormality here. And if you combine both abnormalities together, that will leave us with only one diagnosis. ARVC, 
or ARVD. So arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy or arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. So let's talk about this condition. So ARVC stands for arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, and it's also known as ARVD, so arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. It is a second, the second most common cause of death in young age after hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy in some countries. And it causes up to 20% of sudden death in uh, people with age that is less than 35 years old. The incidence of it is uh, one in 5,000 in the general population. So it's not as uncommon as you might think. And um, it's more in people um, of Italian and Greek descent for some reasons. The inheritance is autosomal dominant, so you need to screen the family when you find one. And again, that will make it not as uncommon as you might think. And in terms of male to female ratio, it's three to one. So it's more in boys. Regarding what happens, regarding the, the anatomical abnormality that is there, the pathogenesis, what happens actually is that you've got a fibro fatty replacement in the right ventricular myocardium. And this results in uh, paroxysmal ventricular arrhythmias coming from the right ventricle because there this is where the pathology is and this results in sudden cardiac death so in terms of the investigations to do in this condition obviously we'll start with an ecg um, which is in addition to the clinical presentation um, is what will uh, raise the uh, suspicion about the condition echo might be useful it might show a dilated hypokinetic right ventricle um, the usual diagnostic tool is cardiac MRI, and obviously the only definitive diagnosis is by the histological diagnosis. But if we're talking about um, an alive patient, that would be a bit impractical. And if we're talking about post-mortem, this is probably too late. In terms of treatment, so if there is no high-risk features, they're usually on uh, antiarrhythmics like sutalol or amiodarone. But if there are high risk features, then they need an urgent ICD. If the patient is suffering from persistent symptomatic arrhythmias, sometimes radiofrequency ablation might be helpful. And in severe cases, a cardiac transplantation might be required. So let's um, get into the uh, core business of this uh, discussion. Let's talk about the ECG changes with arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. So the first abnormality there is these notches at the end of the complex, beginning with the ST segment. They're called epsilon waves. These are the more specific finding when it comes to ARVC, um, but they're seen in only 30% of the cases. The other finding is the T-wave inversion from V1 to V3, and, um, and these are seen in about 85% of the patients. So you'll notice that all the findings are in the right precordial leads, V1 to V3, because the main problem is in the right ventricle. This is the other case that we've discussed before. Uh, this was case number two in our Facebook page. And uh, if you remember, this was for a male who presented um, to me with recurrent episodes of um, VTs. Um, he was a 52-year-old male. He was known to have ARVC and presented with recurrent VTs to me. He's had an ICD in place, but the ICD was um, adjusted to fire when the rate is above 180. And actually he presented to me with VT with a rate of 172. So the ARVC, the ICD didn't work. Um, if you look at the ECG, interestingly, I, you won't be able to identify um, the epsilon wave. I couldn't find it. And, uh, and even the T wave inversion, was not really there. There's only T wave inversion in V3, V4, and V5. But this patient was known to have ARVC. His son was screened as well for ARVC and he was found to be positive. Um, this patient was referred to the cardiology team to readjust the ICD. So let's quickly go through a couple of simple basic ECG facts that will help us a lot um, analyzing ECGs. So fact number one is gonna be with any left bundle branch block, the right ventricle is going to be stimulated first because the left bundle is blocked. And as a result of this, you will see this shape in V1. So let me explain uh, this to you. So let's say that 
this is our heart. So this is your SA node, this is your AV node, you've got the left bundle and the right bundle. So in case of left bundle branch block, then what will happen is that the impulse will go this way and then because this way is blocked, it will start stimulating the right ventricle first before the left ventricle. So we know now that when we stimulate the right ventricle first before the left ventricle, if you look at V1, it will give you the shape of left bundle. And it's going to be exactly the same with right bundle branch of block. So if the blockage is here in the right side, then the left ventricle will be stimulated first, followed by the right ventricle. And in V1, what we will see is either a shape of right bundle like this or like that, or any of the other sorts of um, findings that we can see with right bundle in V1. So this was the first and the second fact. So with right bundle branch block, the left ventricle is stimulated first, um, and this results in this shape in V1. If we apply these two simple facts uh, to the ECG world, we will uh, find so many useful applications for them. So any PVC that is coming with right bundle branch block morphology, we automatically know that this ectopic beat is coming from the left ventricle because it's got right bundle branch block morphology, which means that the left ventricle is stimulated first and vice versa. With pre-excitation syndrome, so if the accessory pathway is in the left side, then that means that the left side is going to be stimulated first. So we automatically know that this is exactly the same as right bundle branch block. So we would expect right bundle branch block morphology in the ECG. And the third one is if we're facing a VT case and we don't know where the focus is, uh, is it in the right ventricle or the left ventricle? Just looking at V1 to see if we've got the shape of right bundle branch block or left bundle branch block. If it looks like li left bundle branch block, that means that the focus is in the right ventricle and vice versa. So looking at this ECG, this is an ECG um, that is showing broad complex regular tachycardia. So this is VT. And if we look at V1, we will notice right bundle branch block morphology. So we automatically know that the focus for this VT is coming from the left ventricle. But looking at this one, and this is, by the way, the ECG of our case. So broad complex regular tachycardia, VT, look at V1, and it looks like left bundle branch block morphology. So automatically we know that this is coming from the right ventricle. And this is the case of ARVC. So the VTs that are associated with ARVC, they're almost always with left bundle branch block morphology. And we now understand why this happens. So that's another thing to add to your diagnostic tool. When you see a, a ventricular tachycardia with a morphology of a left bundle branch block, think ARVC. So back to case number 28. So this was the 19 year old male patient who presented to ED with recurrent episodes of palpitations and presyncope. There was no chest pain or breathlessness. He was in and out of VTs and uh, he was known to have ARVC by the way. So, and luckily all his VTs self terminated without any intervention from uh, the ED team, which made our life much easier. He was then referred to the cardiology team for admission for further assessment and management. So in summary, We've talked about two important things. We've talked about the differential diagnosis of syncope in ECG, and we know now that we've got three no-brainers, ACS, arrhythmias, and pulmonary embolism. We know that we need to check two abnormal intervals, PR interval and QT interval. For both, you check for long and short intervals. Then we've got three congenital conditions. We've got the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we've got the Brogada syndrome, and we've got the arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. When it comes to the ARVC or ARVD, we know now that this is the second most common cause of sudden cardiac death 
in young people after hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We know now that it is of a fibro fatty replacement in the right ventricular myocardium, and it results in paroxysmal VTs and a sudden cardiac death. And the VTs that results from ARVC are with left bundle branch block morphology. And the ECG of the ARVC will show us the epsilon waves, the T wave inversion in V1 and V3. And this is it about this case. So I uh, hope you find this useful and I will talk to you very soon. Bye for now.